Hello friends, welcome to my Pessimistic Guide to Anti-Aging Research, episode 13. Today's menu features David Sinclair, who seems to be everywhere these days, and his recent book. I'm in Moscow right now, so this one comes from Russia, with love of course. Allow me to warn you that my purpose is to find flaws not because of malevolence or generally nasty disposition, it is only partially true, but primarily because I cannot comprehend a concept of idolizing anyone or anything, especially when it comes to the matters of life and death, such as finding cures for aging. We failed every single time in the past. We do not have anything that works for humans as at present, yet the reports on prospective anti-aging interventions are always exuberantly optimistic. Well, <clears throat> first there is a genuine and sometimes desperate hope, which I share too. After all, I hit a 64th milestone a couple of days ago. Second, there is a habit of one-sided interpretation of available data. Third, the excessive focus on one item or mechanism generally discourages broader perspective. I am well aware that I am no genius, but I also know that the others are no geniuses either. So my messages are meant to be a part of discourse between equally ordinary, if slightly conceited human beings. Also, I have a vault. If in the past I used to think that everybody is wrong but me, now I believe that everybody can be wrong, including me. So, quite a shift. So without any further ado, ladies and gentlemen, I give you David Sinclair. I'm still uncertain what to think of him. Is he a scientist with enterprising streak, or is he just a person with enterprising streak who happened to operate in biology? Anyway, I finished reading his book, and here are my most general impressions. It is okay. There is a certain amount of popularized biological content, and about two-thirds of it is dedicated to all kinds of musings on social, economic, psychological, political, cosmic, you name it, aspects of expected significant increase in uh, healthy longevity. And all musings have decidedly optimistic overtones. I will not open it again to read most beautiful and wise passages, there are none. But it was relatively informative and even funny in few places. I do not think it contains any earth-shattering revelations, despite many glowing reviews. I would also edit it down to the half of its current word count, but it is just me. It's too wordy to my taste. It is also possible that I'm missing the mark entirely. I judge this book on the basis of its biological merit, and from this angle it is not terribly revolutionary. However, as a sort of memoir of an accomplished Harvard professor working on aging, this book may be of interest to general public. I do not have any major misgivings, only a few minor comments and objections. The essence of the book, in my opinion, can be boiled down to a few primary features. First, I will not let you forget that I am a Harvard professor and I want to talk about myself. Second, aging is a disease. Third, I have a revolutionary and all-embracing theory of aging, information theory of aging, and let's polish that scratched CD. Fourth, epigenetics is the key to an extended healthy lifespan. And fifth, I do not promote anything I'm connected to, but here is my regiment, and you may follow me if you wish, as any intelligent person would do. There are a couple of dozens, by my count, mentions of Harvard and professorship in the first hundred or so pages. A bit too many, in my opinion. But, if the book is not about strictly biology, but more like a memoir, then I will deem it acceptable, more or less. You can read this in the title and many other places within the book. I have a tiny problem with the statement. To me, a correct definition of disease would be an impairment of some sort in otherwise healthy young organism. See, 
aging is out of the picture. On the other hand, diseases of twilight years are often merely organ system specific symptoms of aging. Somewhere in the book, Sinclair further defines aging as mother of all diseases. Again, I beg to differ because aging can claim maternity only to diseases at later stages of life. In the first chapter, you can find another startling assertion. Sinclair writes, from the looks of it, aging is not going to be that hard to treat, far easier than curing cancer. Radical statements like these violate my inner harmony big time. Isn't cancer just a dramatic manifestation of a fraction of mechanisms responsible for aging, like mutations and epigenetic changes? And if this understanding is correct, how can aging be an easier challenge with all its additional complexities? Also, we have not yet solved the problem of cancer, far from it. Dr. Sinclair's information theory of aging is a nice combination of words for sure, and it is poetically broad, uh, modern, and catchy. It takes us to philosophical heights and at such rarefied altitude, any theory ceases to be actionable. If, on the other hand, we describe it like it used to be, in simpler terms, like deterioration of epigenome, we will immediately find a lot of things to do. As Dr. Sinclair is fond of repeatedly saying, it is a matter of framing. It is true, but I don't think that his framing style creates any additional value, maybe even opposite. Oops, I just had an epiphany. I'm about to come up with, uh, prepare yourself, my own universal and all-embracing theory of aging. Here is my theory, everything theory of aging. Everything contributes to aging, albeit to various degrees in different species. For details, see A Curse of Proxies episode of my guide. By now, nobody can argue against the importance of epigenetics as a very likely determinant of the pace of aging. The accumulated data seems to be rather compelling. My own revelation moment came when I learned about successful serial cloning of mice for 25 generations, which was reported by Wakayama's group. I have to say that Japanese scientists gifted the world with some truly outstanding research in the last couple of decades, including the discovery of Yamanaka factors that can completely reprogram and at the same time rejuvenate somatic cells. In essence, in Wakayama's experiment, the somatic cells of the original animals lived on for 25 generations of healthy serial clones with normal lifespans. Altogether, this gave three additional lifespans to the original animals. In my mind, these results effectively dethroned mutations as a primary determinant of lifespan. The importance of mutations cannot be ignored, of course, but apparently it is not they that limit lifespan of mammals. Dr. Sinclair compares genetic information to digital and epigenetic information to analog, similar to grooves on CD, which get scratched over the years. In my puny book, I call DNA code their wetware and designated the epigenetic com component of information as a software or an operating system. I do think that my analogy is slightly better. According to Sinclair, compromised analog information can be recovered through polishing CD or, in biological terms, restoring the original epigenetic landscape. Tempting, but not easy. At this point, the image of scratches becomes misleading because we are dealing with the peaks that became higher or lower and valleys that became shallower or deeper in the process of aging. Therefore, Restoration needs to be precise and we do not have suitable precision tools that we can apply to the entire genome. The only way to do it, as I see it, <clears throat> is complete reprogramming. The cells must be wiped clean from existing compromised epigenetic programming and new operating system should be installed. This can be done, but the procedure is inherently dangerous because it implies a return to the stem cell state 
and therefore an extremely high possibility of enhanced carcinogenesis. Another consideration. What will happen to our memories slash unique personalities? Epigenetic mechanisms play prominent role in the formation of our short and long-term memories. Will epigenetic reprogramming wipe out memories as well? And if so, what's the point? If I understand correctly, the fundamental expectation is that our rejuvenated bodies will continue their service as vessels for our unmolested souls. My impression is that Dr. Sinclair sees himself um, as a living classic. I get a sense of benevolent righteousness. Of course, it is theoretically possible that I may be wrong, but guys, we all know that the probability of such nonsense is virtually zero. So let me lead your misguided souls in the right directions. Gently. I repeat, the book is fine, but not extraordinary. A reader will find some interesting information and some really good quotes. Some metaphors used by Dr. Sinclair were illustrative, some less so. For example, I think that comparison of epigenetic aging to demented pianist was a flop. But if you want to form an opinion about Dr. Sinclair uh, and learn about his work, this book is probably a good starting point. Also, it would be sensible to not blindly trust everything he says about anti-aging interventions. There is an uh, infinitesimal chance that Dr. Sinclair is wrong, you know. And I think I'm done for today. See you next time.